recording. So uh, welcome everyone to the webinar. Um, my name is Fiona Lewis and um, I'm the BC Patient Support Liaison for AMAC. And as many of you know, uh, AMAC is a leading funder of research into bone marrow failure diseases in Canada. And our organization supports patients and caregivers across the country who are living with aplastic anemia, myelodysplastic syndromes, and PNH. Um, before I introduce our speaker, I just want to familiarize you with some of the features of this webinar platform, which is Zoom. So um, if you hover your mouse near the bottom of your screen, a menu should pop up. And um, there you have the option to um, click the raise your hand button. You can also um, enter questions under the Q&A button or you can put comments in the chat window. So I'll be monitoring um, the questions in the chat window and um, we'll probably handle most of the questions at the end of the presentation. So um, during the presentation, your lines will be muted to uh, minimize the background noise. So I'm really pleased to introduce Dr. Geddes to present today's webinar regarding bone marrow transplant. Dr. Geddes is a hematologist and clinical associate professor at the University of Calgary and Tom Baker Cancer Center. She trained in internal medicine at the University of Alberta and in hematology and hemato hematopoietic stem cell transplantation at the University of Calgary. She has an interest in acute leukemias, myelodysplasia, myeloproliferative disorders, and aplastic anemia, and has a practice in general hematology and hematopoietic cell transplantation. She's active in teaching at the medical school and resident level. So um, yes, just a reminder to put questions in the Q&A and then I will uh, review them at the end. So with that, um, I'd like to say thanks to Dr. Geddes and turn it over to her to begin. So thank you very much for your kind invitation. Um, I was asked to talk a little bit about just kind of how a stem cell transplant works, kind of how the process works. And so I focused a little bit on that today. I certainly would um, be happy to entertain any questions that you guys have at the end, just to help people kind of understand kind of what's the process, what do people go through as they're looking at um, starting this kind of a process. So, um, So today I wanted to review the principles behind stem cell transplantation from a donor, outline the process of transplant and how donor matches are done, and also describe some of the benefits and the possible side effects of stem cell transplants. Um, so I also talk a little bit about how COVID-19 might affect transplant patients. And I think that's something that's very much on people's minds. Um, I actually forgot to put a disclosure slide in here. I'm involved with a number of companies that treat myelodysplasia and acute leukemia specifically, nothing related to stem cell transplant specifically as an advisor and, and the principal investigator of a number of clinical trials um, in Calgary for those diseases. So the first case we have is a lady, a 54 year old woman comes to her doctor after noticing a week of skin rash and easy bruising. She's pale. They do a CBC, so a complete blood count, and it shows she's anemic with a hemoglobin of 68. So it's almost half of what we would um, expect for a woman uh, her age. Platelets are eight, so quite low, and we expect to see petechiae. Usually when platelets are under about 20, and really when they're under 10 is when we see most of them. These are the, those are the little tiny blood spots where she's just bled a bit under her skin with this rash. And her neutrophil count is low, so she's um, at risk of infection. And so they do a diagnostic test, they do a bone marrow biopsy to see what's going on. And it shows that she has an abnormal bone marrow. And so instead of being um, empty, um, it's actually quite full, more full than it should be for her age. So we expect your bone marrow to be full of cells, but 100% minus your age. So she'd be about 45% cells and about 55% empty. But you can see that this marrow is almost completely packed full of cells. And on the right, you can see a normal bone marrow of a young person. The really dark circles are red cell precursors. 
There's lots of white cell precursors, lots of mix of different cells. They're all different sizes and colors. So a good mix of all the cells we, we make when we make blood. And on the left side, we can see that there's an increase in white blood cells and they, they look funny. The, the nuclei, the, the kind of the brains of the cell there, they, they don't look the way that normal cells do. And so chromosome, so that's called dysplasia or dysplastic. And cytogenetic tests showed high risk chromosome abnormalities. So for people with aplastic anemia, it's sort of the opposite problem. In that case, there's usually an immune response where the bone marrow is just empty and you're just not making cells at all. And often we don't see cytogenetic abnormalities with aplastic anemia, although they can happen. And there's some overlap between some of these disorders as well. So, you know, we look at the treatment options for this patient. And on the left-hand side, I have options for people who have lower risk uh, myelodysplastic syndromes. And on the right hand column, it's for people with higher risk myelodysplastic syndromes. So sometimes people don't need any kind of treatment at all. The blood counts are quite stable. They're not requiring any intervention. Um, um, or they might start to need some transfusions to support the red blood cells or the platelets. If there's risk of infection or if they're having fevers or signs of infection, we put people on antibiotics. People who need a lot of blood transfusions over a long period of time might need some iron chelation because of iron buildup from um, loading in the, with the transfusions. And sometimes for people with lower risk leukemias, we'll use growth factors. So um, red cell growth factors like erythropoietin uh, or darbopoietin to bring the red cell count up. Um, and less frequently growth factors for platelets or red cells or platelets or white cells. And on the right-handed column, we have um, treatment options for people with higher risk disease. So this is disease that is becoming more symptomatic. So you might have more cell lines that are low, more severely low blood counts. Um, maybe have an increase in immature cells in the bone marrow called blasts that are starting to look like they're going to turn into a leukemia or um, really high risk chromosomes where we know the chance of having leukemia or having serious complications from the myelodysplasia are high. Um, and so this, these are low dose kind of chemotherapy agents that um, can slow down the process, try to make blood counts better for a while, can try to prevent transformation to leukemia, but are not curative options. And in terms of other things, chemotherapy, I think this slide got a little bit switched around to something. So we don't really use chemotherapy very much for MDS, but we do use stem cell transplants as our only potentially curative option. Um, and we also have clinical trials that we use trying to say for people who are not having transplants, do we have better options that might be able, might have a longer response. So this is sort of the seminal trial looking at hypomethylating agents. So this is azacitidine um, that is compared to conventional care for patients with myelodysplastic syndrome. And we can see that at two years, about half of people on the azacitidine arm are have not progressed to leukemia and are alive. And so this is actually about a nine month improvement um, from where we are before, but it's not curative therapy. And that's always our, um, our cure, cure or prolonging survival and improving quality of life are kind of our biggest uh, goals when we're trying to treat some of these diseases. Um, there is another agent that is available now. It's approved by Health Canada. It's not yet funded by the provinces, but is available through a compassionate care program. And that is an oral hypomethylating agent, d cytobine together with an enzyme that prevents it from being broken down in the, in the gut. So it's uh, with an enzyme called cedurazidine. That hasn't had these big phase three trials, but it is available. And sometimes for people, especially where it's logistically difficult to come to a cancer center for injections for seven days every month, that can be an option. And so when we look at our treatment for some of these diseases, and so with aplastic anemia, um, we tend to use immunosuppressive therapies. And we know that um, in, in patients who are over the age of 40 or who don't have a sibling donor, and for people who are under the age of 40 and have sibling donors, we might go straight to something like a stem cell transplant if they're interested. For people with higher risk MBS, we would look at doing a stem cell transplant as soon as possible, but use some sort of therapy like hypomethylating agents to keep it at bay. But we are always between a bit of a rock and a hard place with transplant. So we know that transplant is currently the only curative therapy for myelodysplastic syndromes and also for aplastic anemia that has not responded to immunosuppressive therapy. 
But the problem is median age of diagnosis for myelodysplastic syndromes is 65 to 70. With aplastic anemia, there's sort of two curves. There's a younger patient population in their 20s. And then again, as people get older. And the toxicity of transplant can be quite prohibitive. So this is not something that's a good option for everybody. Um, and so we're trying to do two things. We're trying to look at better treatment options that are not transplant and also trying to reduce the toxicity of transplants as much as possible. So one of the questions we had is who is eligible for a stem cell transplant? Um, and how, how's that decision made? You know, how do you decide this person should have a transplant and this person shouldn't? And sometimes it's not a matter of yes or no, it's a matter of when, like maybe somebody would benefit from a transplant, but not yet, maybe down the road, right? So I tried it, I tend to divide it up on the mind to kind of disease specific factors and also patient factors when we're trying to make these decisions. So um, the three things that we focus on in this group are really myelodysplasia, aplastic anemia, and PNH. And so um, myelodysplasia is the more common reason for transplant. And this is um, generally, we, we transplant people who have higher risk MDS. And so we have some prognostic scoring systems that we use. Um, and so the revised international prognostic scoring system can be adjusted by age. And you can look at sort of the risk of, your, of the disease itself. And it's based on the number of blasts in the bone marrow, the chromosome testing, uh, the severity of low blood counts. And also there's some, some additional data that's been helpful looking at molecular testing. So next generation sequencing, which is becoming more common for people that have myelodysplastic syndromes to have that done. Um, and so basically we have, if you have intermediate to or higher risk disease, there've been a number of um, decision analyses that have been looked at for um, e even in the post azocytidine era that have said, if you have intermediate to or higher risk disease, the risk of transplant is more than that of the disease, but you have a better chance of long-term survival if you have a transplant. If you have lower risk MDS, then the toxic, like the, the toxicity of the transplant is not always outweighed by the risk of the disease. And, and overall, people tend to live longer without a transplant. And so we tend not to do it at that time. But people who have lower risk disease, it turns into high risk disease, we might transplant them later in the course. So it's always trying to balance the risk of the disease itself and the risk of the transplant. For aplastic anemia, it depends on the severity. So if you have kind of moderate blood counts and they're not too bad, we may not think about doing something as aggressive as a transplant. If, if, um, if people have had immune suppression and they don't respond to it, um, that would be times when we would think about doing stem cell transplant. And for PNH, we don't do a lot of transplants for PNH alone, um, unless it's quite severe. Or sometimes if people are having problems with bone marrow failure or other complications, and we know that there's an overlap between MDS, um, uh, aplastic anemia, and PNH. So patient-specific factors. So this is also really, really important. So we all hear about comorbidities. I think everybody knows that word now because of COVID, right? But this has been something we've looked at for a long time. We look at people's individual health and what other health problems do they have? You know, are they likely to be able to tolerate chemotherapy or if they have infections afterwards, those kinds of complications. And there's actually, you know, people have tried to make this kind of objective and there are some comorbidity scoring systems that we can do with looking at, you know, infections, other cancers, lung function, heart function, kidneys, all of that, that can help us predict what's the risk of toxicity or dying from a transplant. And that can be really helpful uh, when we're having these discussions, right? Now, age on there, that's a controversial thing. So we don't de deny people on the basis of age for stem cell transplant, but we do understand that having a transplant when you're 20 is not the same as having a transplant when you're 70, right? So it is a little bit more difficult. And so um, that's always part of the discussion. Also functional status. So it's not just your chronologic age, it's sort of biologically how strong and fit are you? Are you somebody who um, really can't walk very big distances or is using a wheelchair and then a transplant is going to be much harder versus somebody who's very active um, and is quite strong. So there's sort of a frailty factor in there as well. And for aplastic anemia, it's a little bit different. So in this case, this isn't a cancer, right? So 
age is actually more important. And if you are under the age of 40 and have a sibling donor, we might go to transplant just right up, up front because the risk of transplant becomes a lot less. Um, and so sort of figure those with the, with the, in with the patient factors, as well as the number of blood products you've been exposed to. If you have antibodies against multiple donors that might affect how our transplant will go. So what's the idea behind a stem cell transplant? You know, why did we, why did people start to do this in the first place? The idea is not to try to kill the normal bone marrow cells, right? The idea is to try to get rid of the malignant cancer cells that are dividing faster than the normal bone marrow cells. So with a lot of these diseases, if we were to give enough chemotherapy or radiation to kill the cancer cells, we're gonna affect the normal bone marrow cells as well. They're always dividing fairly, like all the time, fairly rapidly trying to replace blood cells, like including platelets and white cells that have fairly short lives. And so this is a very vulnerable um, cell population. And so if we give high doses of chemo or radiation to kill the cancer cells, we do affect the normal cells as well. And so what we do have to sort of, when we inadvertently kill the normal cells, we have to give you stem cells from a donor to be able to allow the bone marrow to grow again and to be able to make blood. We also recognize though that even though we match, and I'll talk a little bit about how we do the matching um, in a few minutes, but even though we match the donor and the recipient for the, the things that we think are the most important, which is it's your tissue type, something called your HLA type. So these are the proteins that help you decide what is a self cell and what's a foreign cell to you, what's something that shouldn't be there. Um, so even though we match for all the, the big HLA proteins that we think are important, um, there's always some minor differences between the donor and the recipient because you're not identical, unless you're identical twins, right? And so there can be a graft, which is the new bone marrow versus cancer effect as well. So sometimes the new immune system that you get recognizes residual cancer cells that are there and helps fight it. And so it's a combination of high dose chemotherapy and radiation, just try to kill the cancer cells, but also giving a new immune system that might recognize cancer cells that are still there and clear them out. So that's a, called a graft versus disease effect. And this is another key mechanism in, in why allotransplants from a donor work. So the basic process of stem cell transplantation is we identify a donor um, and we collect stem cells from the patient's bone marrow or blood. So right now over 90% of stem cell transplants are from the blood of the donor. Um, so the donors are given injections of a growth hormone called GCSF that makes their white blood cell count go higher and, and puts um, the stem cells into the blood where we can actually go on and collect it. They go onto a machine called an apheresis machine. So they get usually a big IV in one arm and in the other arm, and they sit there for half a day to a day while the blood kind of circles out, goes to the machine, they spin off the stem cells and it goes back into the other arm. And those cells will go to the lab and get processed. And then we'll eat, most of the time we actually give it fresh. This, this picture talks about cryopreservation or freezing, and we do that sometimes as well, but actually most of our donations are fresh. And then, either if it's from outside of the country, a courier will go and pick it up, or if it's from um, inside Calgary, um, we, we basically um, just deliver it off. And usually the next day, the stem cells get infused. So um, chemotherapy. So this is basically, we give high dose of chemotherapy and some radiation to the whole body, depending on what the underlying disease is, the chemo and, the, and, the, and whether you have radiation or not might change. And then the stem cells are infused through an IV line and just like a blood transfusion, basically, we usually have a tunneled central line that goes into the chest wall or, um, and so they will basically be reinfused like a, like a blood transfusion. And it takes about two weeks for them to grow. Um, and that's when we see the blood counts really start to come up. So we do have couriers um, that are people that will go and pick up the, the stem cells from wherever they are and, and come back again. And they will do this on the turn of a hat, right? So usually these are scheduled, but they, you can imagine with COVID, this has been a bit of a challenge. So um, just to explain a little bit, so this is hematopoiesis, which is how we make our blood, right? So we all have hematopoietic stem cells. So this is blood making stem cells. So they don't go on and make you know, your cheek cells or your hair or your liver or your heart or your muscles, they just make blood. So this isn't the stem cell for your whole body, it's a stem cell for your blood. 
and they will go on and divide into two. So you end up with a stem cell for your lymphocytes, which are white cells that help fight infection, and stem cells for your myeloid cells, um, which go on to make red cells, platelets, and white cells. So the red blood cells are what carries oxygen. You know, if those are low, gives you people can be quite tired um, and they may not get enough oxygen to their organs. Platelets are what help you make blood clots and white cells, these kinds of white cells help you fight specifically bacterial infections. And lymphocytes are more important for things, they are important for bacterial infections, but more for viral infections and fungal infections as well. So this stem cell at the top is what we need to replace in the recipient because that will then go on and divide and become all the blood cells. So these stem cells are self-renewing. So if we give you stem cells from a donor, they will go into the bone marrow and start to grow. And they do two things. One is they make blood cells that then go on and divide and become mature blood cells that you can use, but they also go on to make more stem cells. So they're self-renewing. And this, this stem cell infusion then lasts for a lifetime because you rebuilt that self-renewing pool of cells in the bone marrow. So I just wanted to mention, it's really important to know a little bit some of the words. A lot of people will talk about having a bone marrow transplant. And there's a very big difference between having a transplant from your own cells, so that we call an autologous stem cell transplant, and having a transplant from a donor. So that's an allogeneic transplant, okay? So these are very different. The complications are very different. The, the success rates are very different and we use them for different diseases. So today I'm gonna to focus on allogeneic stem cells um, and the stem cell transplant. So this is what we use for aplastic anemia and for myelodysplasia and for PNH. Um, so if somebody comes and starts talking to you about their experience with a stem cell transplant, make sure you ask them if it was from their own cells or from a donor, because if it's from their own cells, it'll be a very different experience. And then there's the syngeneic as well, which is an identical twin, which means you share the same genetic material. So when we talk about an allogeneic stem cell, we basically get it from one of three sources. So one is bone marrow. And basically for that, we would, and they use this more often in kids, and we use it for non-cancer um, sort of sources. So this is what we use for aplastic anemia is bone marrow. And this is where the donor would actually go to the operating room, go under a general anesthetic, and we do basically like 100 different bone marrow aspirates and pull out enough stem cells from the, from the bone, from the pelvic bone that we can actually then infuse it in through the, an IV bag and it'll grow. Peripheral blood is what we most commonly use for things like myelodysplastic syndromes. And that's actually, um, we use that GCSF hormone to make the donor make more blood cells and have it go into the circulation. And then it gets reinfused through an IV and grows. And then there's also umbilical cords and we use these less. Um, there are some limitations to them. Often it's related to the dose of, of stem cells that there are from the babies. So babies are small and we're trying to, you know, grow stem cells in an in a adult. Um, but this is more often used for kids, for example, or for small adults. And it, this can be helpful sometimes when we don't have a full match otherwise. So this is just a little graphic showing um, the increase in the number of stem cell transplants. This is actually from the Center for International Blood and Marrow Transplant Research. We submit all the data on all of our patients who undergo transplant to this registry as well. So this is mainly US, but also includes some Canadian patients. Um, and so you can see that over time, the blue line is the allogeneic stem cell transplant. So this is from a donor. The green line is auto transplants from your own cells. So for both of these, the line is going up. For auto transplant, there was a bit of a blip um, in the late 90s when they were doing auto transplants for breast cancer, and that was found not to be helpful. But we still use it for a lot of diseases like lymphoma and multiple myeloma. Um, whereas allo transplants um, have been increasing just slowly over time at, at a steady rate. So to give you an idea, um, uh, this is the reasons that we do stem cell transplants. And when you look at what diseases we use a donor for in blue, that tends to be diseases where the bone marrow itself is the problem. So collecting your own stem cells and giving them back to you isn't going to fix this because there's a good chance that there's cancer cells in this graph that you'd be giving back to yourself. So that's, for example, our acute leukemias, myelodysplasias or myeloproliferative disorders, 
um, and uh, chronic, some chronic leukemias like chronic lymphocytic leukemia or chronic myeloid leukemia. So if it's a problem with the bone marrow itself, then we tend to use transplants from a donor. If we have, and, and same with aplastic anemia, if you gave your own stem cells back, they're not gonna overcome the fact that it's just not, that they're not producing. So the things where we tend to use transplants from our own cells tend to be things like lymphoma. So NHL is not hockey, it's non-Hodgkin's lymphoma. Um, Hodgkin's disease um, and in myeloma and uh, transplant from your own cells isn't actually curative but it does produce, produce uh, prolonged survival so we still do it quite often so this most of these are diseases where the problem could be in the lymph nodes and the bone marrow itself might be fine so you could take your own bone marrow out give chemo or radiation and give your own bone marrow back to re regrow your blood cells and you're not giving yourself the disease back again but with with our diseases it tends to be an aloe transplant. And I'm just going to go back to this one and show you that what, what, what sources that we've been using over the years. So unrelated donor bone marrow or peripheral blood is the orange line. And that's been going up and up and up compared to match related donors, which is the dark blue line, which is very stable. And that's because only about 25% of people will have a sibling donor. Um, and so we kind of have plateaued at, at this level of about a third of transplants getting um, a 25 to 30% of patients getting a match sibling donor. Um, but overall, the number of unrelated donor transplants we're doing is going up over time. You can see the cord blood transplants kind of peaked a bit in the early 2000s and is coming down a little bit. And what's happening is there's more and more other relatives. So these are often half low identical donors, so half donors. These could be siblings that aren't a full match. They could be parents. They could be children. Okay. And so this is because we're getting better at trying to prevent complications and we're now able to go back and use half donors and that's helped us to be able to find donors for most patients. So with an allogeneic stem cell transplant, so we give chemotherapy and sometimes total body radiation to basically try to eradicate cancer cells. We're also suppressing the immune system and that allows the immune system to get the, the donor bone marrows and not reject it, right? So our chance of graft failure is actually quite low. So for most diseases, um, it's about 2% where the new bone marrow won't grow. For aplastic anemia, it's a little bit higher. It's partly because we don't use as intensive chemo and partly because sometimes people have seen a lot of blood products before and that a bit increases the risk of rejection. And it might be somewhere around five to 8% where it doesn't grow and we have to go back and get more stem cells or do something different. So the advantages, you know the donor stem cells are not contaminated with the tumor, right? And we know that the graft versus leukemia effect can be helpful for people with cancer. So this is for people with MDS is not helpful for people with aplastic anemia. So the donor immune system can fight residual cancer cells that it can see aren't part of itself. And so there's actually some transplants that will use less intensive treatment and, and try to maximize the immune effect from these cells to try to actually control the disease. We tend to do that for diseases that are very slow growing or sometimes in patients who are older or have more, more other health issues where they're not likely to tolerate a, a very intensive transplant. So um, this is also the reason why we use peripheral blood for myelodysplasia. We know there's a bit more graft versus leukemia effect with it and also a bit more risk of graft versus host disease. For aplastic anemia, we use bone marrow because there's less risk of graft versus host disease, but we don't need any graft versus leukemia effect for that one because it's not a cancer. So I'm just gonna mention a bit these non-myeloblative or reduced intensity conditioning transplants. Um, so this again is lower doses of chemotherapy and sometimes radiation to immune suppress the patient. So it's not actually going in and killing all the cells. It's basically suppressing the immune system enough that you can get the graft in, the new donor, donor immune system in and allow it to grow without getting rejected. And then over time, you see an increase in the proportion of cells in the bone marrow that are actually from the donor and less from the recipient. And you're really depending on a graft versus leukemia effect or graft versus disease effect for this to work. Um, it does, however, come along with the risk of graft versus host disease, which I'll talk about a little bit down the road. So it is still an intensive treatment that just does still require um, a lot of care. And the other thing is um, in patients who are who have certain diseases like AML and MDS, um, if they can tolerate intensive treatment, the relapse rates are less with intensive therapy. <laughs> 
So this is just a picture showing the difference between a myeloblative transplant, which is the typical one that we do, um, where the recipient marrow is blue and the donor marrow is um, green. And you can see that we basically start off 100% recipient, give a big dose of chemo and radiation. And if we were to do the bone marrow biopsy, you know, 10 days later, we'd see nothing there, it'd just be empty. And then the new bone marrow starts to grow. And if we were to check it about 30 days after the transplant, you would see it full of donor marrow. With the non-myeloblative transplants, you start off 100% recipient. And if you were to do a bone marrow at about 30 days, you might actually see it's about half donor and half recipient. And then by the time you get to about three months, you'd like to see that this has mainly turned into donor marrow. So how do we find donors? So this is done through the one match. Um, so this in Canada, it's a stem cell and marrow network. Um, and this is found, this is most easily done online. People just go online, go on the website. You can actually see um, there, you can sort of sign up and they would, um, they have some criteria you can check, go through to see if you might be potentially eligible and they will mail you a kit to your house. So you can swab your own cheek and send the sample in. So it's actually very, very slick. Um, and they're always recruiting. So especially um, if you look at the advertisements, you'll see they'll have lots of people with mixed ethnicities or minorities, because those are the types of people that we need the most on the registry right now. So about 25 to 30% of people will have a matched sibling donor. Um, and that can depend a little bit on your cultural situation as well. And for each sibling donor, there's about a 25% chance that they, a full sibling will be a match. So this is why, um, we end up using a lot of unrelated donors. So about 70% of people will have a full match on the international donor registry. So they hit a milestone a few years ago, 25 million people on these registries, and they are connected and report to each other. So if we do a search through Canadian One Match, and they, they will run a world search. And so we'll know if there's Canadian donors, but we'll know if there's donors in Nepal or India or China or anywhere else in the world as well. And we prefer eight out of eight donors, but we'll accept seven out of eight donors as well. And in our hands, survival is very similar between those two, although we know there's a bit more risk of graft versus host disease and the path, the road is sometimes a bit tougher. Um, but where we sometimes struggle the most is people who have, uh, are ethnic minorities where there's not a lot of um, people from that ethnic group in the registry, or sometimes mixed ethnicities where you'll have some genes that are associated with one ethnic group and some genes with another ethnic group. And that is because um, the way our genes are transmitted isn't completely random. Certain genes do tend to be transmitted together um, when, when, when cells are dividing. And so um, there's more chance that those cells will be transmitted together within certain ethnic groups than others. So we definitely transmit transplant across ethnic groups all the time, but we sometimes have a harder time finding that really good match. So about 95% of people will have a cord. Um, and so that is sometimes an option. It tends to be our least preferred option just because the time that it takes for the immune system recovers, it recovers a bit longer. And because of the issues I talked about with sometimes having a limited number of stem cells for a larger adult recipient. But most people would do have a haploidentical donor. So that is somebody who's a half match. So that could be um, a parent, that could be a child, that could be a sibling. Sometimes it'll even be like a cousin, you know, especially if there's some, you know, close relations in the families. So those, that's our other option. So if you go onto the Canadian Blood Services website, you know, they will say they're looking for mostly patients between the age of 17 and 35 who are willing to be a match for anyone. Um, lots of times people get interested in going on the registry because they know somebody, right, who needs a transplant and they want to donate to that person. We always encourage that. It's unlikely that like a random friend or somebody is going to be a match for that person, but um, we have a lot of donors that we have um, been able to use to help other people who've gotten involved this way. So we really do try to encourage that. Um, we, we know that, uh, or especially we're trying to donate people or have people that are donate who come from ethnically diverse populations. That's where really the biggest need is. And sometimes we have the hardest time finding donors for our patients. And again, um, they do, we do prefer male donors and that uh, females are very welcome to be part of this. Don't get me wrong. Um, but if you have a woman who's had pregnancies, she may have antibodies that she may have developed. And so that's one of the reasons why male donors um, can sometimes be proven, be chosen. And also 
because they have a Y chromosome, they have a few proteins that women don't have. So sometimes that can cause a little bit of a complication with the transplant in terms of graft versus host disease. So we always encourage donors, you can go online, um, check and see if you fit inclusion criteria. And if you do, they'll, like I said, they will mail it to you. You get a kit, it's like CSI. You basically can swab your own cheek and send it in. Uh, we have uh, set up these kits. So they were using coffee filters for a while. So if we have people that are, you know, hill people in Nepal or they're in a, in a small center in Africa, for example, sometimes we've had people um, had coffee filters. We have them put some drops of blood in the coffee filters and mail them back to us and we can see if their sibling matches. So um, there's lots of ways that we have tried to innovate to make, make it easy to be able to tell if people are matches. So one of the questions people ask is how are donors chosen? So we talked a little bit about tissue typing and that's by far the most important. It's not even your blood type. We can, we can transplant across blood types and people will change blood types. Um, it's really the tissue type. So these proteins that are called HLA proteins that help you know if a cell is yourself or it's foreign to you. We also look at the age of the donor. So younger donors have a little bit less risk of graft versus host disease. So that's important. We wanna make sure that we're not choosing a you know, 40 kilo donor to give to a 200 kilo recipient. We want to make sure we get enough stem cells. Um, we occasionally will have, we donate across blood types. We'll sometimes find that it takes a bit longer for the red cells to grow. So that's one of our lesser criteria. We donate or we, we transplant across blood types all the time, but we do look at that as one of the less important things. Also, um, if the donor's male could be a little bit more of a preference, but again, that's a minor thing. Um, also, the number of pregnancies from a female donor will minimize that. And we match sometimes for viral, whether you've had viral exposure, especially virus called cytomegalovirus, about 60% of us have been exposed to. So if you've never had it, we try to give you a donor that's also never had it. If you have had CMV, and we can tell just with an antibody test, um, a blood test, then we try to find you a donor that's had it because then you have um, immunity from your donor for it as well. This is a virus that uh, once you have it, it stays latent in your body and sometimes can reactivate after transplant and cause problems the same way that chicken pox can reactivate into shingles. So how's this done? So if you are referred to the transplant program, we ask you to do a blood test so we can look at your HLA typing done. And if you have siblings, um, we will ask if they, we can get their information as well. And they'll be asked to donate a blood sample as well, usually. Um, again, sometimes we'll use coffee filters and get blood in different ways. So this is to basically see if, you, if they are a match. And if there's no appropriate sibling match, or if there's only kind of one sibling, we'll start this process earlier where we do, we run a world search. So they basically put your information into the computer and it spits out a piece of paper and it might say you have 2000 potential donors, or it might say you have two. And then right away, we know what we're dealing with. And this is going to be a very simple search and we can be really picky or if we're really trying to very hard to bring in all the possible donors to make sure that we get a couple. Um, we, we try to get at least two promising donor blood samples. Um, so that means they can actually contact the donor. We know the donor is alive. They are responding and willing to donate blood. And we can, con and, and we can contact them. So usually that's a very good sign. It means they're engaged in the process and they're willing to donate. And so we get their samples, we test them, make sure that they're fully matched. We do some additional testing for CMV and other, th other things that are important to know to clear a donor. And we always wanna have a, a match, like a chosen donor and also a backup just in case something happens. And so overall, if you have a sibling donor, it takes us about two months usually to go through this process. If it's an unrelated donor, it takes about three to four months to go through this process. So there's no waiting time exactly. It's just trying to get all of this organized. And then usually it takes us somewhere between four and six weeks once people have decided, or somewhere around six, six weeks or so once people have decided that they want to do a transplant or not, once we know what their donor status, we have this conversation to actually get people in for the procedure. So how are stem cells collected? So over here on the left, this is a picture of Dr. Chaudhry. So he's one of our um, uh, family medicine doctor who does a lot of our transplant care in the hospital. And he's um, extracting bone marrow from a donor under general anesthetic. And so this is a minority of patients, but if you have a plastic anemia and have a transplant, that's how we would actually get the stem cells from the donors. Um, occasionally from the cord blood and that's collected at the time of the delivery. Um, and this is a picture of a patient who kindly gave me permission to use his name. He's got holding up his bag of stem cells. He's got an apheresis machine behind him. 
And he basically has, you know, basically have one IV in one arm, one IV in the other arm. The blood, the machine comes out through the tube or the, the blood product comes out through the tube, goes through the machine, gets the stem cells collected out and it kind of goes back in. And this lab will check and count how many stem cells we have as we go through the process and stop when we have enough. So that's how people collect their own stem cells if they're going to do an auto transplant. It's also how we collect stem cells from most donors for an allo transplant. So how do you prepare for a transplant? What do you need to do to get ready? So some diseases require chemotherapy to put people into remission before a transplant. For example, acute leukemias. If we have uncontrolled leukemia, transplants effectiveness is really quite low. Um, and for, patient, for people with myelodysplastic syndrome, we do tend to give bridging therapy with hypomethylating agents like azacitidine or decitabine to basically prevent the disease from progressing and try to get the disease under as good control as we can before we come into the transplant. And what we don't want is for it to turn into leukemia while we're going through this process. And then, and just in case the, the people decide not to do a transplant, then they've, they've already started the appropriate non-transplant therapy. For diseases like aplastic anemia and PNH, there is no chemotherapy needed. And this is probably the most urgent transplants that we do. So if we have somebody who's um, under the age of 40 and has siblings, we will do an urgent rush on this and try to um, get this typing done as a priority and basically try to bring people directly to transplant if they're interested in doing that rather than doing other treatment first. And we don't need to give any chemotherapy in advance because the barrier is already quite empty. We do do some tests as well to make sure people are healthy. We want to make sure that if, a if we do a transplant, that's the best possible chance of working and that you're healthy in other ways. So we make sure your heart is pumping well. We don't see problems with, um, with uh, you know, angina or other things. We want to make sure that your lungs are working well. We want to make sure you're free of infections and all your organs are working well. Because we don't want somebody with active infection to go to get immune compromised and then have real serious problems with infection. And we do do a bone marrow biopsy to assess the marrow. It's kind of our baseline to see where things are and make sure that people haven't progressed to something like leukemia, for example. And then we go through the stem cell transplant. So this is just kind of a bit of a timeline to show what this can look like. So um, we will bring people into the hospital to give chemotherapy. And depending on the disease, you might have some radiation as well. And that's done with um, you know, anti-nausea support, just given through the IV. And then the stem cells get infused. And we know that it takes about two weeks for the blood cells to grow after that. And during that time, everybody's blood counts are low. Everybody gets a fever. We kind of expect that. You're going to need transfusions of red cells and transfusions of platelets. And you're on lots of preventative antibiotics and antifungal medicines. And often, especially with the myeloblative transplants, people end up with a sore mouth. And that takes about four weeks on average, three to four weeks before people are well enough to be discharged home out of the hospital. Um, and for the myeloblative transplants, it's usually um, once you're able, your blood counts have recovered, if you're able to swallow your pills um, and you're free of fevers and infections. So aplastic anemia, the protocols are a little bit less intensive. It's actually not as common to get a sore mouth. And for non-myeloblative transplants, there are some centers that will even do those as outpatients. They, we don't expect blood counts to go as low. Um, although for a lot of centers, they'll still have you as an inpatient. So it's less intensive for these non-myeloblative transplants. But average time in hospitals about three to four weeks. And then people are discharged and they'll be coming to the clinic um, at least once a week until they get to about three months after the transplant. Early on, for many people are coming more often and getting IV fluids. Um, and you're being seen to watch for any complications of transplant. After that first three months, the risk of complications becomes less. And people, but I tell people they're, they're really spending that first year just kind of recovering from all of this and, and building up strength and stamina, letting the immune system recover. So it's really kind of that focus. And we still do see people once a month for the first year. After that, it might spread out to be every few years, or I'm sorry, every few months. And then, you know, by the time you get to three or four years, it might be every six months. After five years, we consider these diseases to be cured and we're really looking at survivorship issues and we follow people lifelong for complications that could happen after a transplant. I'll talk a little bit about the survivorship and complications down the road. So until the 1970s, people didn't understand really much about why, how the immune system works after transplant and how to make cells engraft well. And so I spent some time in Seattle during my training and I worked with 
uh, Dr. Rainer Storb, who is um, one of the people who initially developed this process of doing stem cell transplantation. And it's just a fascinating conversation. He told me how they would transplant mice in the lab and they would do great, you know, they would have these genetically pure strains of mice where they were all genetically the same and they would transplant them and they would do great. And then they were trying to do transplants for people who were really at their last treatment option. And they were having all these complications that people were dying of something they didn't understand that we now know is graft versus host disease because they didn't understand about matching. It was actually one of the techs in the lab that did HLA typing realized that she was a match for one of the recipients and donated, um, donated her bone marrow and they were figuring this process out. And he said, you know, we just, we realized that people are more like mutts. You know, we are a mix of all kinds of genetic material from all over the place. And so when they actually had to figure out how to do matching and, and be able to do this successfully, they actually went to and found mutts basically and, and learned how to match, um, uh, do, the, do the HLA typing and tissue typing um, using, using basically dog's blood because this is much more like what we are in a lot of ways. So we inherit our genes from our parents and we intend to inherit them together. So you inherit like one chromosome from one parent and the other chromosome from the other parent, like half of each one and it divides. So you get half of chromosome six from your mom and half of chromosome six from your dad and you put them together. So you have two copies of chromosome six. Um, basically that is how you inherit your HLA genes. And that's why each sibling has a one in four chance of being a full match. So our HLA genes are on chromosome six and they're inherited together as this haplotype. So um, all the genes will come together from each parent, from each chromosome, right? And so this encodes these, they're called major histocompatibility complexes. They're like little presenting proteins on your white cells that tell you that, that will show the antigens to your immune system and say, this is normal, this is part of me, or this is something foreign. It's either an infection or a cancer or something foreign that shouldn't be there, can you fight it? So it labels yourself against non-self. And normally that's a very good thing. It helps you protect, protect against all these things that shouldn't be there like infections. Um, but in this case, we want to be able to overcome that to allow the donor stem cells to grow. So this is just a, a picture. It's getting a little bit um, technical, but it's basically just showing you've got your cancer cell that's got some proteins in it that basically you will then bind to, um, or those proteins will be presented by, um, by the cells to your immune system, to your T cells that then will recognize, those are lymphocytes that will recognize that as being foreign, activate and become killer cells and go and fight those, for, those cells that are effective. So let's talk about complications of transplant. So the first one I'm gonna talk about is this graft versus host disease. Now this does not happen with an auto transplant from your own cells. And that's why it's so important that if someone's telling you about their transplant, you find out is this from your own cells or from a donor, right? Um, so this, we, there's something called acute graft versus host disease. And this usually happens in the first 100 days after a transplant. And this is where the donor immune system is activated by antigens or proteins that are on the host cells, that's the recipient. And so it kind of, instead of, it's the opposite of what we think about with a heart transplant, where you're worried that the recipient might reject the heart. In this case, it's the new immune system rejecting the recipient cells, right? So this is a fairly common cause of complications. It happens in about two thirds of people, but not always very severe. So about half of people just might need topical treatments like steroid creams but half of people will need more immune suppression than that. So acute graft versus host disease usually is in one of three ways. One is it can affect the skin and give you a rash. Second thing is it can affect the gut and give you diarrhea. And third thing is it can affect the liver and give you jaundice. So I give a talk about transplant to the medical students as well. So I went up to the ward and found one of my patients who had a skin rash at that time. So this is what graft versus host disease can look like. And so if it's fairly small amount, you might just get a steroid cream on the skin. But if it's a lot, people might need steroids or more immune suppression. And then chronic graft, we don't think there's any advantage to having acute graft versus host disease. We mainly just try to prevent it. Chronic graft versus host disease, this usually happens after the first three months or so. And it can be, again, the new immune system kind of fighting your body. And it tends to do things like it can fight your mouth. So sometimes people get sore mouth or very dry mouth, um, dry eyes. Um, 
sometimes pigment changes in the skin or thickening or tightening of the skin. Um, that last part is fairly uncommon, but can happen. Or sometimes changes in, small, in the small areas of the lung. Um, so this is again uncommon, but this, but it's very common to have problems with some skin rashes, sometimes dry mouth or mouth sores and eyes. And so um, basically what we try to do is we prevent this as much as we can. We try to make sure we have the best HLA match that we can. We give medications to suppress the immune system before you ever even get your, like right after the stem cells are given, we are already giving medications to suppress the immune system to stop this process from happening where the immune system recognizes your body is foreign. And sometimes we give antibodies. So for example, we use a lot of ATG, which is an antibody that binds to, or antibody from rabbits that binds to lymphocytes and helps prevent graft versus host disease. And that's used variably across the country at different centers um, and more for patients that are at higher risk of graft versus host disease. And if we need to treat it, we'll use things like steroid creams. Sometimes we can use light therapy from the dermatologist. Sometimes we use high doses of steroid pills or additional immunosuppressant medications. And sometimes even things like phototherapy where we take the blood out, expose the blood cells to light and give it back. So, you know, having a little bit of chronic graft versus host disease, which happens in most patients is not always a bad thing. Sometimes it actually goes a bit with the graft versus the disease effect and less relapse of the disease. We just don't want you to have a lot where it significantly affects your quality of life. And about 10 or 15% of people will have a lot where they need steroids, but they might need more immune suppression. And there's a small number of people who are on immune suppression for a long time, even years. And that can affect quality of life. So the two big things we're looking for, graft versus host disease and infections. So infections again are pretty common and you can be at more risk for bacterial infections. So if you think about it, you've got irritated mucous membranes from the chemotherapy, you've got IVs in place um, and the blood counts are low for the first three to four weeks. But we know that even once the immune system, once the blood counts come up, you are rebuilding your immune system with a limited number of stem cells from your donor. And it takes time to build that breadth of immunity, um, even though the numbers of the blood counts look great, right? So um, we know that the people are at more risk of usual things like um, usual infections like colds and flus causing pneumonias, but also unusual infections. So things like some viruses that can reactivate like that CMV or sometimes the virus that causes mono can come back. Um, and also things like fungal infections. So we actually will revaccinate everybody for all the non-live um, uh, all the non-live vaccines at six months after a transplant. And that's because your immune system is probably not strong enough to fight it before that, to, to make a good response. We put people on preventative antivirus medicines to prevent cold sores and shingles after transplant and antibiotics to prevent pneumonia for, for a long period of time after a transplant. It can take about a year for most of the immune recovery, but even a few years to be longer. To get a, a year, most of the immune recoveries happen, but it can take a few years to get all of your T cell function back. So this is a picture of shingles. You know, this is chicken pox that can stay latent in the body and sometimes reactivate. So we put people on antiviral medications that's quite effective at preventing that, but people need to be on that for a long time. Um, we used to do it for a year in Calgary. We've actually extended it to two years now. Um, and this is just a picture of pneumonia. I'm not sure if you can see my cursor, but um, there's a little uh, pocket here that actually looks like it's a bit of a fungal infection, a little cavity in the middle. Um, and so those are infections that we watch for in our patients who are immune compromised. And finally, we have a survivorship clinic. So even after people are five years after transplant, we tend to follow them lifelong. Sometimes we'll have the family doctors do it, depending on where you are and what center you're at. Um, and this is basically trying to make sure that we are minimizing long-term complications of transplant. So we know that if you've had chemotherapy and radiation like this, there is some increased risk of other cancers down the road, like um, skin cancers, for example, um, uh, you know, lung cancers, breast cancer. So we wanna make sure that we're minimizing those risks as much as possible and everybody's getting their appropriate screening testing done. Um, uh, age appropriate, or if you're very young at the time of the transplant, a little bit earlier. We also know there's a bit more risk of cardiovascular disease. So we want to make sure that you're optimizing cardiovascular risk factors. So blood pressure, cholesterol, uh, diabetes, make sure people aren't smoking and staying active. We also know there's long-term effects on fertility. This is less so with aplastic anemia patients um, who get less intensive treatment than it is with people who have myelodysplastic syndrome. 
but um, it's very common to have infertility after something like this. So we do try to address these issues early on. And if doing a transplant is something you think you might want to do, we do talk about um, fertility preservation. So that might include uh, banking sperm cell, banking sperm or um, collecting uh, eggs or embryos. It's important to have that conversation early. So we do in Canada live in a very geographically diverse place. And so we have people that will come to our transplant centers from hours away at times. And this is a real challenge. You know, we have um, most provinces will have a limited number of transplant centers and we'll have people that will come from the Northwest Territories or Yellowknife or, you know, north of Thunder Bay and come down to centers that are smaller or, you know, for the Maritimes, Hal Halifax will do most of the transplants. So we recognize that sometimes people are leaving their homes for a long period of time and coming to stay at a transplant center for about three months and need caregiver support. So this is challenging for some patients especially um, and there are some financial outlays with that right in terms of a place to stay and and just medications supportive medications um, for nausea and antibiotics and things like that that can happen um, and we realize that you know this is our this is the, the place we live in Canada the weather doesn't always cooperate so this can be one of the challenges that patients deal with as well because you do have long-term follow-up through some of these transplant centers. And finally, I just touch a little bit on COVID. So this has been an interesting year. Um, and despite the fact that we had a number of delays in the spring of last year, like I know in Calgary, we actually had a record year. We transplanted more people than we've ever transplanted before. So these things have not stopped. Most of our transplants are not elective procedures and we don't, like most cancer care, it doesn't stop um, because of COVID. So we did have some delays in the spring. Uh, basically what was happening is we were, collecting bone marrow or per, like stem cell samples from donors and then freezing them for two weeks um, and waiting to see, make sure the donors didn't have any symptoms of COVID. And what ended up happening is we never, you know, had any donors that weren't able to donate, but we did end up delaying transplants. It made things a bit more complicated for people. Some people needed more chemotherapy. And so we don't do that anymore, but that might vary between centers. There are some centers that still do. Um, we do screen all the recipients and all the donors that we are preparing to donate um, with swabs for COVID and a lot of centers will do that but it is a bit center dependent on the collection center. Um, and, uh, you know, this is caused some difficulty in terms of getting sibling donors to come so you know usually we have donors that will come from all over come to Calgary donate for their siblings. Um, and then it's the unrelated donors that will be collected at their home centers and a courier will have to fly to Germany or wherever, pick up the sample and fly back with it. So there's been a lot of difficulties around just getting couriers back and forth through quarantines um, and family members that have been unable to get visas or travel. And so this has been an interesting year in that way. We have been using more Canadian donors or North American donors, and we've been using doing more haploidentical transplants from local family members because it's very difficult to get siblings here from Africa or India right now, you can imagine. Um, so we talked a little bit about the travel thing. So the risks for the recipients is another thing a lot of people are concerned about. So we know that there is more risk of serious infections while the immune system is compromised. Um, the uh, bone marrow transplant registries have been uh, collecting this data. So we are reporting every patient of ours who's had a transplant who has COVID. Um, and I have had a couple who are four or five, six years out and they've fortunately done well. Um, but there was about 300 patients, including all hematologic malignancies that were reported um, with the limitations that, you know, you're getting a select number of people have been reported. We do think that the toxicities are higher, especially in the first year after transplant if people have COVID. Um, and we also know that vaccines don't tend to be effective in the first six months after COVID. So we, and we don't know how well people respond to the vaccines afterwards. Right now, we don't have really good testing to say, um, to be able to measure how good each person's individual response is to that vaccine. So this is something we're very mindful of. Um, we do try to make sure that people are following COVID precautions very well. We do try to recommend vaccination post allo transplant once you get to six months. Some immunity is better than none. And we are really trying to encourage people's family members and support people, people around to get vaccinated. So hopefully this risk will become less as the vaccination rates go down. 
Um, we've been very fortunate in our center. We've not had anybody with an early infection after, um, after this, but it also depends on what's happening in the community. So we're all a bit vulnerable that way. So it's a big concern for people. So we really just try to encourage vaccines as much as possible. That's a lot of information. Um, I would be happy to take any questions that people have. Well, thanks for that very comprehensive overview. Uh, we do have a couple questions here. Um, can you advise as to the maximum survival period, approximately? Um, so, you mean how long have pe can people live after a transplant? Um, so when I was training, I used to love to go to Jim Russell. So he was our first transplanter in Calgary. I'd go to his clinics and I'd meet his like 20, 25 year follow-up patients. And they'd come and show pictures of their grandchildren. It was like a social visit every year, I think. So certainly we do have long-term survivors. Um, we know that um, part of what helps contribute to being having a higher rate of long-term survivors, because we have, we have, depending on the disease, um, you know, most people with aplastic anemia will do well. And if you look over time, you can see that we're getting kind of to the 80 to 90% long-term survival for that. For people with myelodysplasia, it's not as high and it depends a bit on your age and your comorbidity. So that's definitely something you have to talk about with your doctor specifically about your situation. So your type of MDS, your age and your other risk factors. Um, but we know that, you know, there's people, because there's more vulnerability to second cancers and other health problems down the road, that's also a really big part of making sure that people live long and live well after transplant, right? So it's not, it's not a thing where you just get a transplant and you're done and you're cured and you go off and live your life. Like we hopefully we do. And there's people that we do see once a year and hopefully forget about us as much as they can, but it, we do follow people lifelong, you know, you're kind of stuck with us. <laughs> Okay. And it's really to prevent uh, those complications. I'm not sure if that answers the question, but um, yeah. Um, another question is, what is the difference between seven out of eight donor and nine out of 10 donor? So we do do matches for 10 out of 10, but we know that like we look at our HLA, A, B, C, and DR are the most important things to match. There is another protein called DQ, which doesn't really matter if it's matched or not. That makes up because there's two copies of each of those genes, right? So HLA A is two, B is two, C is two, and DR is two. Um, so the DQ makes a 10 out of 10, and the DQ really doesn't matter unless you have another mismatch as well. So an eight out of eight is the same as saying a 10 out of 10 in terms of how well you do. If you have a seven out of eight, then that means you have one antigen mismatch. And it's probably the equivalent of a nine out of 10, except we don't really look at that other last antigen mismatch unless you have another one as well. Does that make sense? So it's really the eight out of eight that matters. And we only then look at that DQ for the 10 out of 10, like the nine out of 10 or the eight out of 10, if you already have one mismatch. Okay, uh, if the person who asked that has a follow-up, you can enter it into the Q and A there. <laughs> so if you have an eight out of eight, it's the same as having a 10 out of 10. But we realize that one of those antigens doesn't have to be matched as much as the others. Okay. Um, another question is, uh, what is the maximum donor and patient age? Um, that is a really good question. We don't have a maximum age. When I was a resident, so I'm going to date myself a little bit here. Um, so that was probably about 15 years ago, 16 years ago, the maximum age was 50. And then it, it went up to about 60. And now we'll routinely do people up to the age of 70, of 60 and even 70. And if we've done a few people older than that. And it's really not dependent just on age. So some centers in the US have, have um, done non myeloblative transplants. So you have to pick less ablative transplants um, and less intense treatments as people get older. So it's, it's really, we try not to have an age cutoff exactly. Again, we try to look at a couple of things. We try to look at the disease characteristics and we look at people's health. So sometimes people will be 55 and have many, many health problems. And some people will be 70 and be very fit. And so, you know, that's really kind of what matters more. It's more your kind of your biologic age and your health than an exact age. So we don't have a cutoff at which point we don't do it, but we do recognize the risks do become more as you get older and sometimes the diseases that we get aren't as good risk also when we're older it's 
it's, um, we tend to have higher risk cytogenetics and, and things like that as well. So again, there's not a cutoff, but it, it does color the whole discussion about risks and benefits and what the risks are to you of doing that. And people have to kind of be within their comfort zone about the risks that they want to take to do something like this. And we also look at the disease and say, you know, is this a disease that we're really likely to cure? As if we have a disease that we're really unlikely to cure, even with a transplant, you may not want to take the risks of doing a transplant if you're older or you have other health problems. Whereas if it's a disease that we say, you know what, if we do the transplant, you get through it, we're really likely to cure it. Then people are going to be more likely to take those same risks, right? And in terms of maximum donor age, I think your slide showed it was 35 for the one match. No, no, no that's for unrelated donors. That's what one match likes to have in their registries because there are so many people in the registries already. Um, but for, it'll depend a, very a little bit from center to center. For siblings, we generally try to pick people um, 70 or younger in Calgary, and you might find a bit of difference as well. So sometimes if the donors are a bit older, the risk to them to donate is a bit more or the stem cells don't grow as well. So occasionally we'll go a little bit older than that, but we do tend to try to choose siblings under age 70 if we can. Okay. And um, there's also an emailed question about um, treatment options for someone who doesn't have a 10 out of 10 or a haplo match. So sometimes we will do a nine out of 10 donor um, if we have them or a seven out of eight, right? So we know the risk of graft versus host disease is a bit more, like complications a little bit more, but you know, we, we tend to do a lot of supportive care and overall the outcomes aren't too much worse. Um, if we truly don't have a haplo, so sometimes we'll go to more extended family members and try to find a haplo donor. Occasionally we end up going to a cord. Um, and so that again only works if you have fairly small recipient and you've got a really good cell dose and a good matching cord. And we know that the toxicities of those transplants are higher because it takes a lot of the immune system longer to recover and people's blood counts stay lower longer and there's more risk of infections. So those are kind of the options that we have. Okay, thank you. I'm just checking uh, another question came in on email, but I think you answered a lot of that one. Um, is there, um, how to ask this, is there an effect on survival time if there's a significant time lag between diagnosis and transplant? Um, so if we're, trying to transplant somebody with aplastic anemia before they have immunosuppression, um, it like just as the first treatment, so younger people that have siblings. Um, in that case, we try to go as quickly as we can. And the idea is to try to avoid as many transfusions for that patient as possible, right? Because the regimens we use for that are less heavy, right? And there's a bit more risk of rejecting the donor. Other than that, I would say no, it depends on the status of the disease. So if you're getting transplanted for myelodysplasia and you have a low risk MDS for four years or five years or eight years, and then it turns into a higher risk MDS, we wouldn't start the transplant process until it turned into something that was more higher risk or aggressive. But then if, the, if you're on treatment or your blood counts are really low for a longer period of time, you're more likely to run into complications like infections or other problems from the disease that might impact your ability to tolerate a transplant, right? So um, there's actually, you know, they've looked at for MDS saying, is it better to do a transplant right away at diagnosis or at the time it goes from lower risk to higher risk disease, right? Or if it's progressing to like leukemia. And for that case, the better, the best time to do it when people tend to survive the best is when it goes from lower risk to higher risk disease, right? You don't want to wait until you've turned into leukemia because then the outcomes aren't as good with transplant. You don't want to have MDS for a really long time where you run into problems with fungal infections or other, other serious complications or infections that would, run in, that would give you trouble. But you wouldn't want to transplant when it was still good risk disease because then the toxicities are more than the benefit that you would get for that risk. Mm -hmm. So no. 
um, but we don't want to wait too long. So for somebody who has MDS and is doing well on azacitidine and they say, well, I want to get through my son's wedding in June, you know, we can often do that, but you don't want to wait so long that it will progress to leukemia. Um, and in terms of, uh, again, transplant success and survival time, um, you, I think you've said that, you know, the number of blood, blood transfusions can infect, can affect that. Um, so how many blood transfusions would be too many, this person's? Asking. Well, so the more you have, um, the more you can develop antibodies. It can just give you a little bit of a higher risk of rejecting the donor. So we do transplant people who've had lots of transfusions and we do transplant people who've said, you know, I don't want to do a transplant up front. I'm going to do immune suppression. And then the disease doesn't respond and they end up have, having had a lot of transfusions and we do it. So we will sometimes then intensify the treatment a bit more to prevent the graft from being rejected. So ideally exposure to less than 10 donors is, is the best, right? But there's not, it's not like if you've had 10 donors, you can't go and do it, right? We just try to minimize those risks as much as we can. Great, thank you. Um... So Canadian Blood Services is, has gotten better at a lot of these things too. So they now will automatically filter out white cells from all the blood product donations. And that means you have less risk of getting reactions to the donors of products and, and less risk of antibodies as well. So that's also helping. Great, well, thanks um, for answering those questions. I think that's all we have right now. Um, and thank you so much for your presentation. The, the science of all this, I just find fascinating. <laughs> Very impressive. A lot of information I know, and I don't know how much people are coming into this talk with to start, but yeah, it's definitely. a bit of an overview, right? Of what we do and what to expect. Yeah, and certainly everybody's uh, different where they're at in terms of learning about this topic. So thanks again uh, to everybody who did join us today. I just wanted to uh, mention that our next national webinar is on May 12th, when we will have a social worker talking about the psychosocial impacts of living with a chronic illness. So um, you can go onto the AMAC website and uh, register for that if you're interested. And we do also have... Um, patient support group meetings happening across the country. So you can find out about those on our website as well. So thanks again, uh, Dr. Geddes and everybody else who participated today. And I hope you enjoy the rest of your day. Thank you very much. Thanks.